Hey guys, this is Brother Ray Jones with the First Church of God in Princeton, West Virginia. And I want to welcome you to our Monday, Thursday service. Now ordinarily, we'd be gathering at this particular time, uh, the Thursday before Easter, to celebrate a very special uh, time in the life of Christ in the week leading up to uh, His crucifixion and His death and burial and then celebrating His resurrection on Easter Sunday. But just like so many other things right now, because we're not able to gather uh, up in public gatherings of any group more than 10, really, uh, we as a church have decided to uh, not have public gatherings, and we're trying to offer all of our services in a virtual fashion like you're getting this now. So uh, I'm glad that you're joining in tonight. Uh, this will be different, but it is going to be a Monday Thursday devotion, and we're glad to have you uh, tuning in to be a part of this tonight. Now, normally what's going to take place when we come together for Monday Thursday service is we're going to participate in the ordinances of communion and foot washing. Now, Jesus instructed us in His Word to observe three different ordinances. Now, what an ordinance is, just um, for point of information, an ordinance is a religious practice that Jesus uh, has modeled for us to do by His example and also instructed us to do with His words. So the three biblical ordinances that we practice regularly uh, or that we practice and put into to play are baptism, communion, and foot washing. And, <coughs> excuse me, I want to talk with you about a couple of those this evening. Um, communion as it is described in the New Testament, has its roots in the Old Testament Passover. If you go back and you read in the Bible in the book of Exodus, and when you get up to Exodus chapter 12, you're going to find out about the Passover. And here's a little bit of a rundown of what's going on. God's people, the Hebrews in the Old Testament, at the time that, that Exodus is being talked about, uh, they have been in bondage to the Egyptians for 400 years and they cried out to God for a deliverer and God then sent his servant Moses to go into Egypt and to tell Pharaoh let God's people go well Moses was obedient to that to that uh, charge after being a little reluctant but he got in and he and Aaron both went in and he declared the word of the Lord to Pharaoh and Pharaoh would have nothing of it he was not ready to give up his free labor workforce. So, as um, history has, is telling us this, and the Bible is telling us this, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He disagreed with the command that God had given him through his servant Moses. And God began sending a total of ten plagues on the land. And uh, the, as, as he got through the nine plagues, which were pretty horrible, uh, yet none of them were horrible enough to really get Moses, or Pharaoh's attention. He got to plague number 10, and it's described in Exodus chapter 12. And here's what God says is going to happen. The death angel is going to come over all the entire land, and all the firstborn are going to die. Now, that was a horrendous event, but in preparation for it, here's what God told Moses to tell the Hebrews to do. He said, you are to go and prepare a lamb uh, in a certain way and you're going to roast that lamb and you're going to eat that lamb as a part of a Passover meal. Now there were several elements to the Passover meal including the lamb. Um, uh, one of the other key ingredients was or key parts of the meal was unleavened bread. And among the things that were to happen there is they were to prepare that lamb for their family and as they prepared it, they were to take the blood of that lamb and they were to paint it on their doorpost and on the, the lintel of their door. Then they were to eat that meal together as a family of, of roasted lamb and unleavened bread and various other things. And when they had this meal together, they were to eat it with their traveling clothes on. Because here's what God was promising them. Your deliverance is coming tomorrow. And when you eat this meal tonight, I want you to eat it in preparedness to be led out of bondage. Well, if you read on in Exodus chapter 12, you will find out that uh, the Hebrews walked in obedience to that command. They prepared that meal. They put the blood 
over their doorposts. And that night, indeed, the death angel came over all the land of Egypt. And wherever he saw the blood of that sacrif those sacrificed lambs over the door, he passed over those homes. But wherever the blood was not applied, death of the firstborn came on those households. Can you imagine the heartache and the grief that was shared in the land of Egypt through that time? And as that happened, and people were waking up that next morning, there you could hear the screams begin to, to cry out throughout the land. And once Pharaoh realized, finally, God really does mean business, Pharaoh went to Moses and Aaron and said, Hey, you and God's people get out of here now. They had truly been delivered. And when God gave Moses this instruction about this Passover that was to take place and this meal that they were to eat, he then told them, every year, once a year, you need to have this meal with your family in celebration and remembrance of what God has done for you. Folks, that's very important. Because you see, it's very easy for us to forget the good things God has done for us. And He wanted His mighty works and His salvation, if you will, His deliverance of the Hebrews to be remembered generation after generation after generation. When they would get together, imagine that first year, it wasn't hard for them to remember it then. Uh, it had just happened a year before. But then imagine after decades had passed, when they would continue to this practice and having this meal together, it gave them the opportunity to pass these things down on to future generations so that they could testify of the goodness of God. Now fast forward into the New Testament times. Jesus, in His time, in His lifetime, the people of God are still uh, celebrating the Passover. The Jews are celebrating the Passover. And Jesus celebrated that meal with His disciples. And what we have in the Bible in Luke, the 22nd chapter, is the account of how Jesus celebrated His last Passover, or what we refer to as the Last Supper, with those closest to Him. And the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 22 that after that meal was over, Jesus changed what the Passover was supposed to mean and to be. He looked at His disciples and he took some bread and he broke it. And he told them, I want you to take this and I want you to eat it. And I want you to know that it, as you eat this bread, it represents my body that's going to be broken for you. After that, according to Luke chapter 22, he, he also took the cup. And he said, I want you to drink of this cup. And I want you to understand, as you drink of this cup, it represents my blood that will be shed for you. Jesus was giving them a new ordinance, a, a new um, event to participate in that was going to help them remember what He was about to do for them. It was just going to be in uh, less than a day that He would be nailed to a cross and that His body would be broken and His blood would be shed for their sins. Now, they didn't understand that when he was first instituting what we refer to as communion. But he, uh, they were going to remember it very quickly as these things played out. So now, we as Christians, we partake of what we refer to as communion or the Holy Eucharist. And when we do so, we partake of bread and juice, the bread representing the body of Christ, just as he said, and the cup, the juice, representing His blood that would be shed for us. And we're to do this in remembrance of Him. Now it's probably backwards on your screen, but you'll see back here behind me the communion table here in the sanctuary at the First Church of God on the Hood Avenue. And the lettering on it says, This do in remembrance of me. We do this in gratitude for what Christ has done for us. We do this to remember His sacrifice. And just as the Old Testament lambs were sacrificed and the blood was spread over those doorposts to bring deliverance, 
we as New Testament Christians realize that Jesus is the Lamb of God and His blood is what delivers us from sin. So, ordinarily, if there weren't all these other things going on with a pandemic and physical distancing and not being able to gather up, we would be here at church tonight and there would be several of us who would partake of communion. You've done this a lot, I'm sure, where you had the juice in a cup, kind of like this one right here. And you had the bread in a really small form of unleavened bread like this. So how do we celebrate communion when we can't gather up and do this together? And we're not at church where we have the little plastic cups filled with Welch's grape juice usually and the little uh, communion wafers that uh, we've had in stock for quite some time. Well, here's what I want to suggest to you tonight. If I were at home uh, with my household, in my case it would be just me, you, you can do this by yourself. It's great if you have uh, people with you to do it, but you can do this by yourself. Now, I want you to understand the importance of this is not so much the elements that you use, but that you have the meaning behind it. So let me suggest to you tonight that while you're there at home, you probably have some crackers. You could take some crackers, and that can be the, uh, your unleavened bread. Now when it comes to the juice that you would use, most of the time in church, as long as I can remember, we've used Welch's grape juice. We couldn't just use any grape juice, right? We had to use Welch's. So you might not have grape juice at home, but you have probably some kind of juice. And honestly, what I would do if I were at home and wasn't getting out and wanted to celebrate communion, I would use whatever juice I've got. And here's the juice I have most often at my home, Sunny D, strawberry orange. So I want to encourage you tonight to get some juice, Get some unleavened bread, i.e. crackers. And you can simply have communion with your household or just by yourself. And it could go something like this. Lord, tonight I recognize again that you are the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Lord, tonight I'm grateful for the sacrifice that you made for me. Lord, tonight I pray for your blessing upon these communion elements. And as I partake of this bread, I do so remembering, Lord, that it represents your body that was broken for me. And as I partake of this cup, Lord, I realize again that it represents your blood that was shed for my sins. So tonight, Lord, as I take communion, I do remember your sacrifice for me, and I'm grateful for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Communion is an ordinance that we're to practice. Ideally, we want to be together to do it. But even if we can't be together, we can partake of communion. Now there's another ordinance that is associated with this time of the year. And it is con in conjunction with the Last Supper and Jesus instituting communion. The Bible tells us that uh, he did something else at that particular gathering. And you can find that story in John chapter 13, the first 17 verses. Let me summarize it for you. After the Passover meal had been uh, partaken of by, each, uh, by Jesus and his disciples, uh, Jesus began to do something to teach the disciples the importance of humility and servanthood. If you can imagine the setting, this last supper that they had together was a private event. Uh, Jesus had gone into Jerusalem and they were hunting him down. You know, they, they needed to have a small gathering where not a lot of people could know where they were or what they were doing. So as Jesus and the disciples got together, the customary um, people being there, being a uh, having a servant there didn't happen. 
and it would be customary for a servant to be there to wash the, uh, the guests' feet as they came in to partake of this special dinner. Well, nobody was there to do that. And if you can imagine that in Jesus' day, they walked almost everywhere they went and they all wore sandals. So the fact that when they would come in to a place, they would have very dirty feet and they would need a servant to do that menial task for them. Well, there wasn't a servant there and none of the disciples volunteered to take on that role. And Jesus watched that play out during this meal. And as the disciples were there, they'd finished the meal, they were visiting, they were talking. Jesus very quietly went and got a basin and some water and a towel. The Bible says that he went one by one to each of the disciples and he began washing their feet, taking on himself the role of servant. Now can you imagine how that was playing out? All those guys sitting there talking and visiting, and all of a sudden they begin to notice, hey, look, look what Jesus is doing. The room got quiet, I'm sure, at that point, as they began being humbled by their master and their teacher bowing before them and washing their feet. And according to this story in John chapter 13, when Jesus got to Peter, Peter said, Lord, I'm sorry, but I can't let you wash my feet. And uh, Jesus looked back at Peter and said, Hey, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any part with me. And Peter got all excited then, just like Peter normally does. He says, Well, hey, uh, you just wash me from head to toe, basically, is what he was saying. And, and Jesus looked back at him and said, Look, you're already clean. I just need to wash your feet. Just let me do this. I'm going to do this. And Peter accepted that. And and Jesus washed Peter's feet and all the other disciples' feet. And the room, I would imagine at that point, was really, really quiet. After he had finished serving each of his disciples in this way, he sat down and he looked at them and he said, Do you guys realize what I've just done? I'm your master and your teacher. And I've served you in a way that none of you volunteered to serve any of us. I want you to understand, servanthood is where it's really at. And I've given you an example. What I've done for you, you need to do for one another. Now, if you read throughout the New Testament, the Gospels in particular, you'll find out that those disciples had a pretty hard time learning to be servants. At one point earlier uh, in, in the time of Christ and His life on earth with them, they had got into a dispute over who was going to be the greatest among them. And He just had to explain to them, Hey guys, if you want to really be great, you need to be a servant. And He said of, his own, of Himself, The Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve it and give His life a ransom for many. Well, it was after that little discussion they had, they still didn't get it. And now he says, okay, I'm really going to try to make this point stick. He washes the disciples' feet and he says, hey, you need to do as I've done to you. Now, let me tell you just a few things very quickly about servanthood as Jesus models this for us in John chapter 13. One thing is this, Jesus served voluntarily. Nobody had to twist his arm to get him to do what he did for the disciples. He did it with a willing heart. Not only that, when Jesus served, he served his friends and his enemies. He counted each of the disciples as friends. But we know because of the time we're living in, and we can read the story, that one among that group was about to betray him. And Jesus knew that too. That was Judas. And he didn't skip over Judas. He washed Judas' feet as well. Jesus served voluntarily. He, he served his friends and his enemies. Jesus didn't brag about his service. He just simply and quietly did what needed to be done. Jesus also gave us an example and stated beyond the shadow of any, any doubt, I've done this for you. You need to do this for one another. Now, ordinarily, 
on this particular Thursday known as Monday Thursday when we gathered up to do communion we would also literally have a foot washing service and, and I just want to tell you as I say that I know that that may sound strange to some of you you may wonder what that is I want to try to explain it to you as best I know how uh, we'd get together the guys would get into a special into a room somewhere here on the church property and uh, the men would simply take off their shoes and socks and uh, some would be seated and others would go and get a basin like this and a towel and put some water in it and you would just kind of sense and see who's in the room and go to one of your brothers and kneel before them and you would simply have them put their feet in the water and you would just put the water over their feet and then pull them out and dry them off with this towel and it's a simple reenactment not a full reenactment, but a simple reenactment of something akin to what Jesus did that evening. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Participating in something like that is a very humbling experience. To kneel before someone else and simply wash their feet is a humbling thing. And the only thing that, honestly, I found to be more humbling than that is to be sitting in the chair and allowing someone else to do that for you. Uh, I've been in several foot washing services, and I've been blessed in each and every one that I've been a part of. And as I explain this to you tonight, to just kind of give you an idea of what happens in one of those, I'm sharing this with you with the understanding that this is something you can't do and maintain social distancing, huh? Uh, I mean, you, you really got to be right there physically with someone and you can't do this from six feet apart. Although I did have somebody suggest to me earlier today how that might be possible, but we won't go there. <laughs> to do this the way Jesus did it, you've got to be really, really, really close, all right? And I understand we can't do that tonight, but here's what I want you to get. The principle behind Jesus washing his disciples' feet is to teach humility and servanthood. And while we're trying to battle COVID-19, we can still be humble and we can be servants. We can't do a literal foot washing service, but we can serve our brothers and sisters in our community and our world, our, our country and our world right now through this difficult time. Let me suggest a few ways. Right now, one way we can be servants and wash our neighbor's feet is by staying at home, by not getting out any more than we really need to, to help uh, stop the spread of COVID-19 or anything else that may be going around, but particularly COVID-19. Another way we can be servants to one another right now is continuing these practices of maintaining physical distancing and doing some of these things we should have been doing anyway when it comes to hygiene, washing our hands regularly and covering our coughs and sneezes, and if we're sick, stay at home, get the appropriate medical attention, and those kind of things. Those are being, those are servant acts in this day and age. But there's some other things that are coming to light right now. Maybe during this time, you know how to sew. You've got some material at your house. You can be a servant in that way, like Ginger Gibson has been for me, and you can sew up some masks and make those available to people. Maybe there are some folks who are uh, supposed to be staying at home and need some encouragement to stay at home because they're in that at-risk category, and you can go to the store for them. You can go to the pharmacy for them. Maybe you can make some food for them and do so, prepare it well, uh, and, and then just call them and let them know you're going to leave it at the door, don't go in to visit. You know, I, I know how badly you want to do that. That would be great, but that's just probably not going to work, at least uh, for the short term. But there are a lot of ways that we can put servanthood into practice, which is what Jesus was trying to get the disciples to see as he washed their feet. Guys, I want to thank you for being a part of this Monday Thursday devotion. I hope you've heard something in this that has blessed you and encouraged you. And I want to invite you 
to be back with us on Facebook Live on Easter Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, I got to tell you, I, I would love to have just a house full of people here at the church. And I'm at the front of the line wishing that this was not our reality. But while Easter is not going to be the same this year, it's still going to be celebrated. We're going to have a virtual service on Easter Sunday. But that service is going to celebrate a very real and a risen Savior. I hope you'll be a part of that. Thank you for being a part of this tonight. God bless you and have a great evening.